joining us is Elliot Dennis. Elliot, always good to have you here on the Market Journal desk. Thanks for coming back. Yes, thanks for having me again. Let's get your general feel of the cattle market in particular here, early 2024. How do you see things? Yeah, so when we're talking about, we really have to focus on the cattle on feed report. A lot of heavy inventory right, right away. And so we're carrying that inventory into 2024. And there's reasons why we're doing that. Feed costs are down and cattle prices for feeder cattle to replace those are, are up. And so we're seeing really heavy weights and a lot of inventory out there. And a lot, if we compare this to where we were at, the closest comparison is really 2021. And if you think back, that was with COVID and we were struggling with getting through a lot of the backlog and pro processing capacity. Prices will generally go over the last five to seven years have generally go up about two to three dollars a hundred weight from where we see it in January to about that April, June contract. Um, this is on the cash basis. And when we think about it, where we were at, that went up to about $20 in 2019. We're not gonna see that run up. And so when we compare where we're at to where we could be, we're thinking in that 180 range at a kind of a high level, we're probably not gonna be at that 190, 190 plus range that we were seeing on the futures market back in September, at least for the April contract. Yeah, I want to get your thoughts. Uh, obviously, the, the story to start this week was the snowstorm. That has persisted with another system moving through yeah. later in the week. And then we've got these Arctic temperatures. USDA comes out with the estimated slaughter, both for hogs and pigs. Were you able to track the numbers, see if uh, plants were disrupted by this snowstorm? And I guess as we look ahead, how, how disrupted could they be? Yeah. There will definitely be a disruption that, that is coming out there. We're seeing places like the Holcomb, uh, Kansas plant. That one's, you know, shut down, at least temporarily. We have other plants that are kind of idling. A lot of that has to do with worker safety. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a similar situation if we think about to other plant closures. This would be, I would say, probably in that more realm of like general maintenance, although this wasn't scheduled. What that ultimately does from a producer perspective is it, it kind of limits upward price movement. We've seen that really middling value in, in the cash market. We've seen that also in the futures market. That That's really what that puts downward pressure on price because we just have more supply availability. And it's a shock. That has nothing structural to do with the plants being able to function or we can actually, when those storms move through, we'll be able to process. And where do we make that up? We make it up in the Saturday kill. Yeah. Kind of a two-part question for you. How is beef demand right now? And how does that look when it comes to box beef prices? Yeah, so when we think about the box beef cutout, it's actually a composition of the actual primal. So we have like the rib, the loin, the round. So all of that kind of constitute uh, what we call the box beef cutout. And really in the last part of 2023, we were seeing a lot of these other values like ground beef and the 50s and the rounds. Those were really kind of depressed, but that box beef price was hanging strong. And the reason that was is because a lot of that uh, was in the rib. And so we had a strong rib value. Well, if you've seen the rib value, it's dropped almost $100, 100 weight in the last you know, month. And so that's why we're starting to see some of that you know, relaxing on that box beef price. And that has a strong indication of like, consumers are basically tapping out a little bit on what they're able to willing to pay. If you see the meat demand monitor from Kansas State, that shows very strong indications that consumers are reaching kind of a point where they're not willing to pay uh, a little bit more. Ultimately, that means is we have to balance what they're willing to pay and that total supply coming through the pipeline. Okay, you mentioned the Catalan feed reports. Also happening this month, we have the uh, yearly, or I said, should say happens twice a year, it's the cattle yeah. inventory report. What are you going to be watching when that report comes out later this, this month? Yes, the big is, you know, what is the coal cow numbers going to look like and total cows that we have to breed and the heifer retention. Everyone's talking about where we're at and rebuilding the herd. That has to, everything to do with whip number of cows that we have and the number of heifers that we're going to retain. Cows really determine what the, the feeder cattle supply will look like going into this year. Heifer retention looks like what we're going to herd rebuilding in 2025. We'll look at where we're at in cold cow slaughter. We are above the five year average, but below 2022 at our slaughter, which was very high. We're going to see a reduction uh, potentially in that herd still. And so we're thinking those are the two numbers that I'm really looking at. Of course, when we go to the July inventory report, we're thinking about how many of those cows actually calved. And there's ways that we can think about producers managing some of that risk. Let's pause on the cattle, come back to that here in a little bit. Want to get your thoughts on the uh, the hogs and pigs side of things though. Lean hog market, I guess, has rallied a little bit here in 2024. Any particular reason why? 
Well, we're thinking about some of it has to do with some of the adjustments that happened. USDA came out with their adjustments. We're thinking about strong, basically, sow reports that have been out there. And really, we're talking about this is kind of a larger impact on what Prop 12 is, is really doing. And so we're thinking about where that's at and how that's restructuring the market. We have geographical distribution of where those sow farms are going to be. And I think there's just still a lot of uncertainty about you know, where, how much demand is actually going to go into California. We know that they're strong. Does it just change product? Does it come pre-cooked? There's a lot of that things. A lot of, I, was, I see a lot of uncertainty in, in the hog market this year. Something I'm going to be watching a lot more closely, just given this is really just a fundamental market change. We bring up Proposition 12. Of course, a lot of our viewers are very familiar with that issue, but for those not, it has to do with the amount of space that, uh, that California voters decided a uh, hog has to have uh, to be sold as pork in the state of California. How much, uh, you, you look at these challenging prices for pork producers, how much of that can you attribute to uh, the challenges in that market, Proposition 12, that is, versus something else like exports? Yeah, so I mean, exports are a huge component. That's been weakening on some on the, on the hog side, and so that's been de decreasing prices. But when we also think about we're having really good litter rates, and so that means, you know, instead of a lot of these, you know, animals dying before they're actually able to reach their full maturity, that's been some of the strongest levels since we've seen PEDD, you know, so, so that's also contributing. That's putting some downward pressure on, on prices. And just hog margins in general have been, have been very low. And so you kind of put all those things together and it, it, it becomes a challenging marketing situation, especially for people who are sow producers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's wrap up with this. You mentioned uh, something that uh, producers should be aware of back on the cattle and calves front. WCRP, that's an acronym. What's it stand for, Elliot? It's called Wing Calf Risk Protection. And essentially what that is, it's a USDA RMA product. It's federally subsidized. And essentially it's going to cover total weaning weight. And so you think about your total number of animals, total weaning weight. Basically it can provide some protection against that. And there's lots of variation for people who are familiar with crop insurance, it functions more like yield protection and revenue protection. And so the reason why I bring it up is it is has kind of like a set deadline. USDA RMA is going to come out with prices and products January 15th. You have producers have till January 31st to basically make a decision, which will be valid the entire production year till November. And so if it's something you're interested, in, it's important to be kind of prudent and, and diligent beforehand. Uh, find an agent who might be interested at the Center for Agriculture Profitability at the University of Nebraska. We've, we're doing, we've done a webinar in, uh, this past week and we'll do a, one in the following week. So that kind of explains a little bit about what the product is, how it's priced, and what are some strategies that can be used. And it's important also to note that wean calf risk protection precludes you from using livestock risk protection. So if that's something you've been using in the past, then it's, it's important to kind of weigh those strategies. Mm -hmm.